A name that has slipped into obscurity is Arthur Maundy Gregory. Yet in his time he was an actor, theatrical producer, part-time spy, magazine owner, political fixer, nightclub owner, hotelier, homosexual, fraudster, blackmailer, man about town, publisher, and the possible murder of two people. This is Vintage Murders, and the extraordinary story of the devious Mr. Gregory. He was born on the 1st of July, 1877, and was the son of the Reverend Francis Gregory, Vicar of St. Michael's in Southampton, and Elizabeth, who came from genteel but much impoverished Cornish folk. After attending Bannister Court School, he went up to Oxford University, but left in 1899 before graduation. Initially, he was going to follow in his father's footsteps as a clergyman, but saw his real future in the theatre as he became an actor before going into theatre management for the touring company he worked for. But his first attempt failed, as he was dismissed by the owners because of fraud. He teamed up with a boyhood friend called Harold Davidson, who had become the vicar of Stifke in North Norfolk, who later achieved notoriety as the prostitute's padre, defrocked, and was eventually mauled to death by a lion in a sideshow in Blackpool. They put together a theatrical syndicate called the Combine Attraction Syndicate Limited, which later crashed into bankruptcy in 1909, when the orchestra refused to perform on the first night of a play, unless they received the wages that were due to them. This put an end to Maundy's career in the theatrical world, at least for the time being. But during this time, Gregory made his first attempt at blackmail, he coerced Lord Howard de Waldron and several other rich people whom he wanted to invest in his soon-to-fail venture in exchange for his silence in some of their activities. In 1910, he started the Mayfair magazine, which was modelled along the style of society publications like the Tatler or Vanity Fair, but was in fact a gossip sheet. It was here that he started to acquire significant contacts and friends, including the then Duke of York, later to be George V, as well as the great and the good in society at the time. But this led him to amass a lot of information and rumour, which he turned to his advantage. As a result, one of his sidelines was to set up a detective agency specialising in credit ratings based on information gleaned in hotels and restaurants. During the First World War, he served as a private in the Irish Guards, but never actually saw any action. He had been able to avoid serving in the forces until called up in April 1917. It was around this time that he met Vernon Kell, who was the director of the Home Section of the Secret Service Bureau, later to become MI5 who had responsibility for investigating espionage and subversion in Britain. Kell employed Gregory to compile files on possible foreign spies in London. But the files also contained the sexual habits of people in high places, including the government, and especially those who were homosexual. He later did similar work for MI6 and the Special Branch, it is possible that he used some of this information to his own ends as a means of blackmail. It has been claimed that he was responsible for revealing to the American ambassador the contents of the diary of the Irish nationalist Roger Casement, which contained the latter's homosexual dalliances. Roger Casement was caught gun-running and was eventually executed. There have been rumours that he helped to pen the Zinoviev letter, which helped to bring down Ramsay MacDonald's Labour government. If true, 
He was certainly of great use to the security services. Gregory had fingers in a number of pies, including the Ambassador Nightclub at 26 Conduit Street in Mayfair, and a hotel in Deepdee near Dorking, which became notorious as a place for a dirty weekend by rich Londoners. But the selling of honours was to become his main source of income. A knighthood, for instance, would cost £10,000, and baronetcies £40,000. It has been estimated that he received £30,000 per year in commission from this business, as in 1918 he was appointed to be the honour salesman for Lloyd George's Liberal Party. He was not alone in this activity, as the Conservatives had their own man called Harry Shaw. The honour selling racket got so out of hand that the then monarch George V complained about it in a letter to Lloyd George, which read, I cannot conceal from you my profound concern at the very disagreeable situation which has arisen on the question of honours. The catalyst for change was the 1922 birthday honours list, where a number of very colourful business characters were included. They were of the likes of Joseph Robinson, one of the so-called South African Rand Lords, who had been found guilty of fraud. Sir William Vesty of the meat business and a well-known tax evader, Samuel Waring accused of war profiteering, and Archibald Williamson, whose oil company had been trading with the enemy. This resulted in the Honours Prevention of Abuses Act of 1925. Gregory changed his strategy and started selling papal titles, but when times got hard after the 1929 Wall Street crash, reverted to the tried and tested strategy of selling dubious British honours. In September 1920, Victor Grayson, who combined his roles as a noted speaker on religious matters and labour politics, denounced Lloyd George for selling honours as a means of raising cash for the Liberal Party and openly called him corrupt. But Grayson's activities had already come to the attention of the special branch as both a Bolshevik sympathiser and a friend of Irish rebels. Gregory had been asked to spy on him from as early as 1918, as Grayson had been described as a dangerous communist revolutionary. Gregory was known to be an affable figure, and quickly became friends with Grayson. But Grayson was nobody's fool, and realised the true nature of their friendship. He declared to friends that two can play at this game and that he would bring the honours selling racket to an end. But in September 1920, Grayson was attacked and badly beaten up in the Strand, perhaps as a means of warning him off. On the 28th of September, Grayson was at his West End flat and drinking with some friends when he took a telephone call. He announced he was going to the Queen's Hotel in Leicester Square and would be back shortly. Later he was seen by a witness crossing the Thames in a motor launch and enter a house on the opposite bank. This house was owned by Gregory. Grayson was never seen alive again and it was widely believed that he had been murdered and his body secretly disposed of. The disappearance of a known alcoholic socialist troublemaker who had lost his parliamentary seat before the war and now a friend of Bolsheviks and Irish terrorists was unlikely to be of much interest to the establishment. Years earlier, Gregory had met an aspiring actress called Edith Rose when they had acted in a play together and remained good friends. She and her husband were very friendly with Gregory and the three agreed to purchase property on Thames Ditton Island, which Gregory called Vanity Fair. The couple split in 1923, but Gregory and Edith remained in the house, and later moved to 10 Hyde Park Terrace. The relationship between Gregory and Edith was entirely platonic, as he was homosexual. They were a feature on the London scene, and even went on holiday, to places in the Mediterranean. 
Like many people in the 1930s, Gregory was short of money and reverted to his old honours racket despite the recent act outlawing it. As the punters were engaging in an illegal act, all was well. Gregory, in desperation, asked Rose for a loan, which she refused. Whilst Gregory was a rogue, he certainly had been generous to Edith over the years. Aside from taking her on holidays abroad, she only paid a nominal rent and was entertained for free. On Friday the 14th of August 1932, the weather was hot and Edith was about to have lunch when she became violently ill. Gregory was called in his office and as her normal doctor was not available, Gregory was able to find a doctor plumber. When he made his house call, he recommended ice packs and aspirin before leaving. He returned on a number of occasions and eventually prescribed morphia. Edith thought she was dying and asked Gregory to prepare a new will. The witnesses were Dr. Plummer and Mrs. Ayres, the housekeeper. He read as follows. Everything I have, if anything happens to me, to be left to Mr. J. Maundy Gregory, to be disposed of as he thinks best, in accordance with what he thinks I should desire. She had handed over her considerable estate, which included various properties in London, and stocks and shares, to a man with an overdraft of four pounds, five shillings and fourpence. After a few days, Dr. Plummer stopped coming, and her regular doctor, Dr. Blair, attended while she got better. On the 30th of August, Dr. Blair pronounced Edith as being quite well, and ceased to see her. Her former housekeeper and friend, Mrs. Howard, visited her and Edith remarked that she had a small stroke and could not remember anything. On Sunday the 11th of September, she relapsed, and Dr. Plummer was called again, and visited her three times on Sunday, and twice every day of the week. Even before the Sunday visit, Dr. Plummer was becoming uneasy, because it was proving difficult to wake her up. He called a heart specialist, who diagnosed eurythmia, a consequence of alarmingly high blood pressure and kidney disease. He noticed that she had an enlarged heart and foresaw a little chance of recovery and could only recommend complete rest and even more morphia. On the early morning of the 14th of September 1932, she was pronounced dead and Dr. Plummer described her demise as a stroke. At this stage, there was no mention of Gregory giving food or drink to Edith, so the question of poisoning her was out of the question. In any event, he was of the type who could barely boil a kettle. But the other aspects of his behaviour were definitely suspicious. Initially, she was to be buried the following Friday at Whitchurch near Pangbourne on the Thames, where there was an old church on an island. When this proved impossible, Gregory drove up the Thames to find churches that would bury her. He found to his consternation that the church cemeteries were either full or reserved for parishioners. Eventually, he found a riverside church at Bisham, beside the Thames, and on payment of £100 was able to secure a plot. The funeral took place, but the coffin was unsealed, and on Gregory's orders, the top of the coffin was buried 18 inches down, as opposed to the usual 6 feet. The churchyard was known to flood from time to time. Is it possible that a body in a shallow grave could be washed away by the floodwaters of the Thames and lost forever? Meanwhile, the will had to be sorted out. There were three bequests, two to the niece and effectively one to Gregory. The aunt and niece had a tempestuous relationship and the first will was torn up, but the aunt relented and her niece was the main beneficiary of the second one. 
The niece was not told of the death of her aunt until September, by which time the third will had been approved, very much in Gregory's favour. Was this a convenient or coincidental death to Gregory's advantage? After all, he was a man with an interesting, if not chequered, past history. But justice was beginning to catch up with him. He was losing money everywhere, as the depression meant fewer takings at his nightclub, or dirty weekends at his hotel, and he was being hounded by the banks. By 1932, Gregory was in serious financial difficulties, mainly due to owing several people a considerable amount of money for honours that they never received. One of the prospective clients was Lieutenant Commander Edward Billiard Leak. Gregory had approached him through an acquaintance called Mr Moffat of Datchet. At first, Billiard Leak thought it was for the recognition of his father's services during the Great War, for providing a hospital to the nation, but was perplexed that the offer needed £10,000 paid to Gregory. He pretended to be interested, but approached his solicitor, who contacted the police at Scotland Yard. At a subsequent lunch, Gregory produced to Billiard Lee a copy of a CV which effectively contained information on his contacts with the papacy and exiled Russian and Greek monarchies, but no mention of who he knew in the British political establishment. Gregory was arrested on the 4th of February 1933 and charged with corruption. However, he was able to turn this to his advantage by attempting to blackmail some rich acquaintances into giving him the money to pay his creditors and thus avoid going to court. This brought consternation to the government as they were worried about what Gregory might divulge during a trial. He was approached covertly by an official and assured that if he kept his mouth shut, he would receive the lightest sentence possible. At the inevitable court case, he changed his plea to guilty, and on the 21st of February 1933, he was fined £50 and sentenced to eight weeks in Wormwood Scrubs Prison. On his release, he was whisked away, not by an employee of the hotel or the nightclub, but by Captain Kelly, formerly of Naval Intelligence, and now part of a patriotic right-wing group called the National Publicity Agency. Gregory first went to New Haven, before going to Dieppe, and he was rewarded with £30,000, and given a pension of £2,000 per year, provided he stayed away from Britain. He settled in Paris, where he lived in style. Back in England, his creditors would have to whistle for their money. Aside from Edith and the banks, he owed money to the local garage, solicitors, his gardener, picture framer, Dr. Plummer, to name but a few. The trustees in bankruptcy wanted to extradite Gregory from Paris, but there was not enough evidence. They even tried to sue the estate of the late Sir George Watson, as the transaction was illegal, but the case went nowhere. Bear in mind that this conveyance occurred in 1923, and cash for honours was only outlawed in 1925. The niece, and even the estranged husband, were unhappy with the outcome of the death of Edith, and got the authorities to exhume the body. Unfortunately, Bisham Churchyard was completely waterlogged. After one winter, the coffin was completely immobile, due to a combination of its weight and the water within it. It took nine men and a winch to extract it. The attending doctor cursed that there was not a hope of finding any poisons on the body. A home office pathologist examined the corpse and agreed with that assessment. Gregory and his beloved Pomerarian dog lived happily in Paris at 8 Rue de Anjou. He changed his name to Sir Arthur Gregory and was remembered as a typical old bachelor with a fondness for whisky. 
People who knew him thought he was a retired civil servant who was very secretive about his work and thought he was involved in the security services. He received his pension regularly by registered mail until the outbreak of war. As France collapsed, he retreated to Brittany and stayed in a local hotel over winter. He was betrayed by a shopkeeper to the Nazis in 1941 and transferred to Drancy internment camp, where he died on the 28th of September of that year. Did he kill Victor Grayson as part of a conspiracy? Grayson had lost his constituency prior to the First World War and descended into alcoholism. There were calls for wide-ranging reform of the whole honour system at the time, and the 1925 Act was the result. Gregory had certainly made a nuisance of himself by this stage. Edith Rose is a different matter. His behaviour after her death was distinctly odd. He had ordered from Harrods at a cost of £100 a decent coffin, but never paid for it, but ensured that the lid was loose-fitting and the whole thing buried at a depth of only 18 inches under the surface of the ground. Any traces of poison in the body would have been washed away in the waterlogged churchyard. (laughs) ¶¶ 